Hey everyone, Dan Henry here, and I am super excited to present to you this episode where we interview Alex Harmozy on the show. Alex and his wife, Layla, are the founders of acquisition.com, where they have a hundred million dollars per year in revenue from the companies they own, uh, including their own companies, their portfolio companies, and uh, of course, just the wealth of knowledge that Alex has in building multiple, multiple, multiple eight-figure businesses. We talked a lot about both the high-level uh, uh, view and, and fundamental mindset that entrepreneurs need to have to grow to the next phase, as well as a lot of super tactical uh, things that you can do to grow your business uh, increase word of mouth, increase uh, sales dramatically, uh, make more from less customers, all kinds of awesome goodies. Uh, we started the podcast uh, immediately um, talking about growing our calves because um, <laughs> we're both into weightlifting, obviously Alex a lot more. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and jump into the interview. It's going to literally start mid-sentence, uh, but you're really, really going to enjoy this episode. Alex dropped a ton of value. So with no further ado, Enjoy. This is how to think. So, you know, it's funny. I watched your video on um, on on training your calves because my calves and my traps weren't growing, and I watched the video and I was like, "Well, this makes sense." So I started doing it. I started like literally doing calves, set ten sets of calves every single day, as well as shrugs. And lo and behold, it's only been like a week and a half, and I can literally see them growing. I was like, "This dude was right." <laughs> So, yeah, everyone works out like three sets a week and they're like, my calves aren't growing. I'm like, no shit. Like you walk around all day long. Your calves can take a lot more than three sets. Like, Right, right. Well, I saw another older video you did or or it wasn't a video, it was a post. And you were, I think you said you did like 30 sets every workout, full body every single day. That was your, that was your workout. I was like, holy crap, that's a lot of sets. I've been doing it for a decade. I've been training that way for a decade. I've been training for almost 20. Yeah, and that makes sense. Like a lot of times people, and, it, and it's sort of like business because a lot of times people are like, well, why aren't I bigger? Why, why, am not, why am I not a bigger person? Why don't I have bigger muscles? And it's like, because this guy over here is doing 30 sets a day and you're doing three. And then it's the same thing with business. Like, why am I not making more money? And you're just doing one tenth of the work or one tenth of the effort that the people who are Dude, making it's money. even a tenth a lot of the times. It's like a hundredth. <laughs> Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's one of the things I tell this story all the time because I think it drives it home. So hopefully the audience will appreciate it. So I was really early in business and I had my gym. So I like you had like a brick and mortar that I kind of started out with. Um, this is my first gym and I was told to put flyers out. Right. And I was like, OK, I'll put some flyers out. So I put some flyers out from a guy who did, was a really successful business owner. And uh, I ended up meeting up with him, you know, a few months later or something. And he was like, oh, how did the how did those flyers work out? And uh I was like, ah, not, it didn't really, uh, you know, we got like, I got one call from a guy who said I dinged his car and, uh, and he was going to sue me. And that was it. That's all I got from the flyers. And he's like, well, uh, you know, what was your test size? And I was like, uh, what do you mean? And he was like, like, what was your test? size? like, what did you test before you did, you know, the main amount? And I was like, I didn't do a test size. He's like, well, how much you put out? I was like 300. And, uh, he's like 300. He's like, I don't even test with less than a, with less than a thousand. And I was like, what? And he's like, yeah. And then when we start doing it, we do 5,000 a day. And I was like, fuck. Uh, and so like, and he was doing 5,000. So he was doing 150,000 flyers a month to drive business into his small business. And I was here jerking off about 300. You know what I mean? And so like he did 45 times, I think the effort that I did to get the outcome. And it's the same thing with like DMs and phone calls. And it's like, well, how many, you know, I know you had your rule of 100. And so over the last, I literally got a message that said, so over the last uh, eight weeks, I sent a hundred DMs and I was like, bro, it's a hundred a day, a hundred a day. You took, you did a hundred over eight weeks. That's one fifty sixth the amount of effort that is required. So it's just like, there's usually this massive gap between what people think is required to, to get the outcome versus what is. And they're like, what if I double? It's like, dude, it's, it's not even 10 X a lot of times. It's like 50 X the amount of volume or same thing with phone calls. Like I make 10 phone calls a day. I'm like, bro, our guys minimum quote is 200 a day. 
for the for the call team. You know what I mean? And so people just don't get. I, I'll tell, I'll give you a different story because this happens all the fucking time. I had one of our portfolio companies. We're trying to we're we're scaling up the traffic, and um, I was like, bro, you need to make more creative, and you need to do it on a more consistent basis. And he was like, okay, that's fine. Um, and I was like, dude, we make creative every. I was like, you need to start every fourteen days. You need to make have a full creative day and like run, you know, create new ads, all that kind of stuff. And so I got an end of day thing. And he was like, hey, man, the, the first creative day went awesome, recorded four ads, um, really excited. And I was like, what the fuck do you do all day? Four? I was like, dude, we would do like 40. You know what I mean? Like minimum. And when we were at like, you know, full swing, because right now for us, uh, cold calls on, on the gym on side was is now like 75% of the business. Um but when when ads were the the vast majority of the business we did we were running like 30 to 40 new ads every three days you know what i mean and uh he was like what and i was like yeah bro like i don't know it's like it's like it's just there's just a massive difference and and he thought four was a lot and doing four every two weeks he thought was a lot and so i'm like what was he doing before right yes. and so you know what i mean but like that's the thing is just like people just have this massive discrepancy between what what is required and what they think will make them successful. Do you think a lot of that is, you think that's always been that way or it's being further uh, uh, perpetuated by society? Because you know, when I, I used to work for uh, like direct TV and I remember we were expected to make 200 dials a day. And if the phones went out or something like that, there was a tech issue and we called up and we were like, hey, the phones are out. Our boss would be like, why aren't you already on the phone with the cable company getting it fixed? Why are you calling me, you know? And the expectation was so much higher and nobody was sitting there saying, well, you know, you gotta pander to people's emotions and feelings. It, you just did your job. And to, I, rec I recall, you know, in today's world, I've, you know, I've had a conversation with like a sales rep who wants to make all this money being a sales rep and I'm like, how many dials did you do today? And they're like, oh, I didn't. And I'm like, well, I need you to do at least 30 by lunchtime. And they're like, 30 by lunchtime? You know, I, that's just not enough hours in a day. And I'm like, dude, not everyone's gonna answer. You could do 30 in the next hour. What are you talking about? Like just the, the fundamental lack of understanding and acceptance around that. Do you think that it's worse today because of like society and culture? Or do you think it's just always been that way? No, I mean, I think there's a, a slight, you know, degradation over time, but I think it's, I think it's cyclical. Um, so, I mean, like there's lots of like macro stuff, but I think it's like every 80 years or so there's like the big pendulum that swings. And so it's like, you know, like hard times build hard people, hard people build right. good times, good times, build soft people, soft people build hard times. Right. And so I think that we're in the hard people built, you know, we're soft times built soft people stage right now. And I think that, you know, we will have a, another hard time and it will build more hard people. So, I mean, I think a lot, I think it's very likely that we will be the, like our generation will be the one that will have to step up in the next decade or so um, and become a harder generation, which I think, I think we'll rise to it. I mean, I think people are amazingly resilient when they have no choice. Like if we think about like human capacity versus like what is societally accepted, like I think a lot about like really dark times. I think a lot about like Auschwitz and slavery and things that were really, horrific kind of human experiences and huge populations were able to go through it. And those same people prior to, well, obviously it's slavery wouldn't, that wouldn't, that wouldn't work. But like prior to that experience, you might have people who were, uh, you know, softer and then they go through things like that. And it really fundamentally changes them. And to the same degree, if I were to think to myself, like the difficulty of my life compared to a lifetime of slavery uh, is different, <laughs> right? It's a different level of, of difficulty. And so I think like knowing that that is possible gives us a lot more potential for effort because this is like we're so untapped in, in what we, you know, in the amount of effort that we put forth into the endeavors that we pursue. Awesome. Awesome. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so le let me ask you this kind of feeding off that because it's one thing that I've noticed is there is effort. There's lack of acceptance around how much effort but then i've seen a lot of people including myself we put effort into the wrong places you know like we started talking before uh we, we began recording and your companies you know your you guys you and your wife are doing a million a hundred million dollars a year 
and you're in a hallway right now with no art on the wall. You, you t I, I, I thought it was the camera angle, but d do the thing with your hands. Like, the, <laughs> like literally, literally, you can touch both sides of the wall. You're in this this hallway in your uh, obviously beautiful condo in in Vegas. But like, dude, like you, you know, most people they have this big office with this nice views and this over the top stuff and these, and maybe they have like crazy lighting and stuff <laughs> and they just go overboard but you're just like screw it i'm in this hallway and i'm just building this you know billion dollar play um would you say that part of your success is the fact that you're basically just the ultimate minimalist like i mean everything that i see from you is ultimate minimal right it's like an iphone videos for your youtube it's your logo is just acquisition.com it's just and your website is just like blah like you know you just intentionally <laughs> don't give a shit about any of the stuff that most entrepreneurs obsess over do you think that's part of your success rather than minimalism i would say it's form over function so it's not just because i think i think it can look similar but i think it's it's somewhat it's the, there's it's a shade different um you know what i mean like for like this tank top this particular like white tank top that I wear, like I bought 40 different brands and I tried different sizes on so that I could find the right white tank top for me. <laughs> and like, I, I bought, I bought all the highest rated barefoot shoes on Amazon. Cause I was trying to, cause I realized I don't wear t-shirts. It was something I was like, I wonder if I could eliminate t-shirts from my life. So I don't wear t-shirts. I either wear, I have a beater or I put like a flannel if it's cold or I put a Hawaiian if it's hot. And that's it. And so that's just like what I wear up top most of the time. And then like with shoes, I was like, can I eliminate socks? And so I tried all the bare, barefoot shoes on. And then I ended up realizing that I liked my Crocs the best, but now I'm just informed on it. So I like got rid of all those. And like, I wear Crocs just about everywhere. I, I figured out I can work out in them. So I was like, great. I don't have to have workout shoes. So anyways, all that to say, I think it's, it's just like, what's the function that's required. Um, and I think a lot of times people miss the forest for the trees. You know what I mean? Like, I think the YouTube video stuff works, even though the quality is poor because, uh, you know, the stuff is useful for people. Um, and then also for me, from a form over function standpoint, if I, if it takes me more effort to do the other thing and I become less likely to do it as a result, then mm. the overall function goes down. So it's like, if I do one third the videos and they're prettier, will I get the same output as, three times the videos that are kind of quick and dirty. And for me at this point, I do that. I'm not to say that I wouldn't, like if I can figure out a way to get the function down where it's like really effortless for me uh, to do nicer ones, I'll do nicer ones. It's just that right now it's not, like my, I don't make my money from, from influ you know, like being an influencer or whatever. Right. Well, I mean, the quality, so qual qual you got to look at the categ categorization of quality because from a content perspective, your videos and the content you put out is better than like virtually everybody else. Like, you know, most people are like quoting uh, uh, the four hour work week and stupid shit. And you're like literally giving actual hardcore advice that makes sense and that is stuff that most people charge for. And it isn't even that good. And, and, you know, so in that case, would you say that the ability to focus solely or at least focus the most on the content is just any any view of like fancy cameras and all that stuff is just a distraction from creating amazing content. And ultimately, that's what people care about. I think it comes second. It's exactly that is like it comes like it's it, I think there's some benefit to it. I just think it is less benefit than people give proportional to their focus. So it's like, let's say it's 80, 20, you know, 80% comes from the content, 20% comes from the touch. I think people put 80% on the touch and 20% on the content. Mm. And so it's like, I think if we, if, if you allocate the attention or the focus appropriately, then you'll get the outsized outcomes. And I think fundamentally, like the people that move fastest in life are the ones who employ the most leverage. And so a lot of employing leverage in business and whatever relationships is understanding where the points of leverage are. And that means that being able to look at a lot of variables and identify which of these ones has the most influence over the outcome, and then ruthlessly focusing on that one variable and, and driving it. And I think most people will focus on a lot of other variables that they don't see don't have a huge effect on output. And the easiest litmus test for this, and this is for anybody in the audience, is 
if right now you're working, you know, most of your hours of the day, for example, it's not that you need to work more. It's that fundamentally what you are working on is not effective. Like you might be doing stuff and you might be producing things. Like you might actually be getting things done. It's just that the things that you are getting done are literally irrelevant. <laughs> and so like you're, I mean, it's kind of like cutting grass with scissors. Like you can do it. It just doesn't make it meaningful, <laughs> which is really disheartening for some people, but it's also the truth. So then let me just dig a little deeper there. What are, what would you say are two things that most entrepreneurs and especially, you know, online entrepreneurs uh, do that they don't need to do? And what's two things that they're not doing that they absolutely need to do? I can answer the second one better than the first one. Cause like okay. my answer for the first two would be anything you're doing. That's not these things. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, you know what I mean? Good. Like, right. Like people do a zillion crazy things. Um, and so with regards to the things that people need to be doing more, like there's, I think if, if you, if you boil everything down, like to what are the, what are the, again, what are the points of leverage? Like, what are the things that actually grow a business? Right? Like number one is you can get more customers. Number two is you can make them worth more. It's literally it. So everything flows down from that equation at, at the top. And every time we have quarterlies, with the, you know, the portfolio companies and things like that. Like I always write it on the board as a reminder to just be like, guys, we're either making this number go up or making this number go up. What is all of these, you know, these quarterly objectives that we're doing, how is it going to drive that versus how is it going to drive that? Right. And so it, like the two most important things are getting more customers and making them worth more. And so then it just depends on which of these things is the bottleneck within the business. And in the beginning, and this is where a lot of people fuck up, is that like zero to 1 million, one to 3 million-ish in that, in that range is you have to learn how to sell something to someone, right? It's one product, one avatar, one channel, very simple process, right? Which is really just finding product market fit, which is what they call from the software world, is do people want the thing you're selling? That's it, right? And can you get them to give you money? It's all it is, right? But going from like three to 10, for example, um, you can gas, like you can gas marketing all, you can just keep acquiring customers. The thing is, is that like, in order to keep doubling down on that, you have to start, you have to double your sales velocity every time you want to double the business. So it's like, I go from selling 50 customers a month to hundred customers a month. And I sell from hundred customers a month to 200 customers a month. And I go from 200 to 400. And it becomes really untenable at a certain point to keep selling more people. And then that's where the business will plateau. And so instead, the better way of growing the big business is as soon as you have product market fit, which is selling shit that people want, and they're actually buying from which is usually you're making one to 3 million ish, right? At that point, you pause an acquisition and then you focus all of your effort on how do I retain these people? How do I get them to never leave? How do I extend the LTV per customer so that even if I sold the same amount, my business continues to grow, right? And so... Usually, if you fix that properly during that period of time, you can keep the same acquisition numbers and then expand the business from three to 10 million with a lot less effort, think leverage. And then, then when you go and jam more marketing into the business, then it just, boom, you're at 30, boom, you're at 50. You know what I mean? And it's just that most people just think, oh, I started marketing that made me some money. So I'm going to market more to make me more money. And it's, it's not that. I mean, you will make what I would consider like you will become rich doing that if you just want to market a lot, but you will not become wealthy because you will not build assets that are valuable because people will not want to buy a thing that's purely built on just front end and not tons of like word of mouth and other, you know, and, and, and higher LTV metrics. And then what happens is the media arbitrage that most people figure out in order to acquire the customers usually shuts down. And then all of a sudden their margins compress and then it becomes untenable for them to acquire the amount of customers that they were. And then overnight, they disappear. You know what I mean? And that's what usually happens. Whereas if you have a stable base of customers uh, that continue to pay you because they like the thing that you're doing, it gives you the gross profit margin to then weather those storms and then build other channels. Got it. Got it. So then let me ask you this. You probably have a lot of data uh, on this next question already. How many portfolio companies do you have currently? We have, if you don't include the three that Layla and I still have, big chunks of that we sold majority of, but we're still uh, 25 to 40% owners in those companies. Um, we have uh, seven, eight. 
So a, so so a company. So I would I would say that that's not one or two. That's a that's a pretty fair amount to be eleven between all of them. Le, okay, so eleven. So then let me ask you this: When you start working with a portfolio company, I imagine that, and you've probably helped or coached or somehow interacted with a lot of a lot more companies than that. My question is, you probably are seeing patterns, right? Like as soon as you start working with a company you probably see the same mistakes over and over again, or you start changing the same things over and over again and they repeat. Can you expand on what what are those repeated patterns or what's the first thing you usually change that you just consistently see? I would say that there are, there are different archetypes of entrepreneurs. So just as a, as a hair to that, like as a shade of gray or nuance is that there are product driven entrepreneurs and there are promotion driven entrepreneurs. And so like, and then, you know, the best ones can do both, but most of them tend to have a, a leaning one way or the other. Right. And so if we have a product driven entrepreneur, usually we have to focus on acquisition stuff. Right. And that's, I would say that's probably the minority of the time. I would say that's maybe like 25% of the time, the other 75% of the time, it's usually promotion driven entrepreneurs, at least the ones who come to me are maybe attracted to my stuff. And to be fair, my company's called acquisition.com. So like maybe the promotion guys are more attracted to the stuff that I talk about. Right. Um, and so with the promotion guys, it's usually we have to fix backend stuff. And so it really depends on what they're presenting with, because like the way I see it, it's like, imagine you have a, a Mona Lisa painting that's, you know, what, what is the embodiment of like a 50 or a hundred million dollar business. And then we've got whatever their current business looks like, which is a uh, Mona Lisa that has like gunshot and bullet holes all over it. It's like, okay, how, how do we look at this and then just systematically fill in the holes? And so two different businesses might have like gunshot holes in different areas of the painting that they currently have that has potential to be a Mona Lisa, but it's not there yet. And so we just kind of fill in the holes based on that. But big, big picture, most companies at that size, um, they have really, really shit data tracking. So usually they don't have consolidated metrics. And that's a big one because it affects everything that you're trying to improve. Like if you don't have all the metrics and tracking around like customer lifetime value and your acquisition metrics from click to close, then it becomes really difficult to make decisions. And so then you're just shooting from the hip, which is just not that effective. So getting the right data in place. Second one, and this is probably pretty universal, is that the talent at that stage is low. So usually it's the genius of the thousand hands model. You've got one guy who's kind of like really pushing and driving everything. And then a lot of people just like help him out or her out, right? And so what what's what's required at that point is that we need to have like the first like true mid-level leaders uh that's kind of like directors and managers that need to get uh put into place and sometimes those directors and managers can can level up even beyond that to go from 10 to 30 and sometimes we have to replace them and it just depends on whether they're willing or able to grow um and so it's a it's a data problem it's a people problem um and then there's usually some sort of uh i don't want to say this is one that's not like necessarily a problem, but like what we're really good at is figuring out the best ways to monetize businesses. And so it's like, how can we reconfigure how we price? How can we reconfigure the thing that we're selling or create some sort of ascension or some sort of tied in continuity um, to increase the lifetime value uh, per customer? And so that's kind of the, those are like the, I would say the three bigger buckets that we look at is like, we got to get the data right so that we can make the strategic decisions. And then once we have the strategic decisions we need to do to build the beautiful Mona Lisa painting that we want to paint, then who do we need on the bus uh, who is either there and then who would need to get off the bus? Because I would say, I'd say either probably, it's more than a third and less than half the time. So in that range, we also have to fire a bunch of key people um, or I would say like their key roles in the, in the business, but they are actually sabotaging the business. And so we've had two instances or three instances and not necessarily even uh, fire is a strong word, but like we have to fundamentally move the org chart a lot, right? Sometimes we have to let somebody go, but sometimes it's like, it has to be a major move. Like, you know, <clears throat> maybe the CEO is actually a really good CMO and he's not really a CEO, right? Like he just, he's a founder, but like, if you look at Shopify, um, the founder, I can't remember his name. I know I feel like an idiot. Um, but anyways, the founder, uh, he's a product guy. And so he's not CEO of Shopify, even though he's the founder. He's just chief product officer because that's what he loves doing. And that's what he's really good at, right? And he found a CEO to run the business. He recognized his own deficiencies. But a lot of times people's egos cannot take that. Um, and it's the thing is, that? it's always like, what does the business require, period? 
And then like, that's what it requires. So whether it's you or something like that is what is required. And then it's just having a conversation of like, do you want to become that person or do you want to find that person? So what do you mean by their ego gets in the way? A lot of people don't like, p- people have attachments to the, the title of CEO. They're like, mm. I want to be CEO. It's my company. I'm like, well, I mean, it's a business that requires a CEO. Like you do not need to be that person. Like Warren Buffett's not CEO of any of his companies. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I, I could, and is that, does that lead into playing to your strengths a lot? Because, you know, for me, I've always thought if I was going to be a C anything, it would be a CMO, not not a CEO. Because the, the operational aspect of business is the part I like the least. I mean, it needs to be done, but it's the part I like the least. I, I like, you know, I, I grew up watching Mad Men and thinking that was the greatest show in the planet and just coming up with the best ad campaign was, to me, that's like art, you know, it's like painting, but you're painting with products. Totally. Yeah. And so the best people see whatever they do is art. So the best product guys talk about product like it's art. The best operators talk about culture and meeting and onboarding and leading like it's art. I'm so glad to hear you say that because I have always, my entire career said that, you know, I grew up an artist, right? I was a poor musician, played guitar, and I never could get that to be successful. And so when I started learning sales and marketing and building a business, I didn't really view it as a business, you know? Cause I was that, I was that like anti-corporate uh, guitar player. And I was like, you know, fuck these guys. Like, so, but then I realized that that is, it's just a different canvas. It's a different stage. And I always viewed, building the business and ads and marketing and creating products as art, not as, you know, I mean, obviously it's a business, but I viewed it as art and I've said that a lot. So to hear you say that, uh, it just <laughs> lets me know I'm on the right track with that thinking. I think it um, has to be art. I mean, cause it is certain, like, you don't, you don't need more money. You know what I mean? And so it has to be something that you would do. Like if you would play music all day long, if you didn't need anything ever, then it's just, and this is a lot of people won't like what I'm about to say, but I'll say it anyways. Um, like to compete against the people, if you're like, I really want to make money, but you don't really like business. I think it's like, I started in fitness and then I realized I had a deeper passion for business. Like I liked it more than I liked fitness. And I, and I was obsessed with fitness for a long time. But like when I, I, like the day I started my gym was the day fitness became number two. And then business became my first love. Um, and I'm still, you know, in my love affair, you know, with business, <laughs> my long-term relationship with business. And it's because like, like the only way you're going to beat everybody else is, is to truly love it. And if you don't, I think it's very difficult to do that. And I think it's just like maybe picking another metric or a different bone to gnaw on. Um, but I had, I have one quick thing. I was pulling it up while you were, um, we were talking about the art thing earlier. So like a lot of marketers will talk about how their products are amazing right? Like how many times have you heard people like, no, 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 no. Our, our course is awesome. Our program's awesome right. or whatever, right? They say that. But the thing is, is like, and I've, I've done this at like a couple of like workshops I've been invited to. And I'm like, all right, who here knows what their, you know, their CPM, their CTR, their, you know, their, their CPL, like their set percentage, their close rate, their CPA, their CAC, like what, who, who knows all those numbers? Everyone's like, oh yeah, hundred uh, percent. Uh-huh, I'm like, cool. I'm like, what's your, what's your TTV? What's your CHS? What's your NPS? What's your churn? What's your activation points? What are CRC? And they're like, what? I'm like, right. So how can you say you have a fucking good product and you don't even know what the fucking metrics are to track good product? Mm. Well, I mean, I think that just goes into the fact <laughs> right? that most entrepreneurs you know I mean? are kind of full of shit. Silence in the room, right? <laughs> yeah. Wow. I mean, I mean, and that makes sense because, you know, if you think about it, most entrepreneurs are full of shit. And even if they're <laughs> like, no, I mean, look, I'm, I'm just going to look, I, I'll just say this. Okay. I've, you know, I've personally worked with, and you've worked with a lot. I've worked with tons of entrepreneurs. One of the biggest things is um, online coaches, course creators, even agencies. And I've always given blunt, direct advice. And I can't tell you, if I had to sum up my experience with most people, and and I was probably this way too when I came up, so I'm not like judging, but it's really like, hey, you are currently full of shit and you need to understand how to not be full of shit. And now you can sort of really see 
the forest through the trees and see what needs to be done because you you've you have this cloud over this lens your 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 glasses are dirty you can't see the real world because you're stuck in this alternate reality that you've created and it's and I like it. I like how you just broke it down. You're like, listen, do you, you feel that you have a good product, but that is a feeling. That's an emotion. That's some shit you need to talk to your therapist about. What are the metrics? What is the data telling you? Is the data telling you it's good? Or do you just feel it's good because you just want to wake up and think life's great. So I, I think that that's a great point because as an entrepreneur, isn't it about that? Isn't it about the data and analyzing the situation and, and making decisions and not about just feeling a certain way you know wouldn't you wouldn't you say that that ultimately is that next level is detaching yourself from that and just looking at it as it is yeah and most people just don't know what ideal scene looks like and so that i mean the biggest threat that most people and i, I mean i would say the biggest threat to all entrepreneurs is that they are ignorant is that we are ignorant of what it takes to be successful at whatever the next level is for us and so like i this concept is one that has just like frightened me and like to my for my whole life which is I heard, I think I heard Myron say this on stage and it was like really impactful for me. He said it was, it was a close for him, but I just think it's a, it's a, it's a great concept. He said, it's costing you a million dollars a year. Every year you don't know how to make a million dollars. And to me, yeah. that's the tax of ignorance. So like everyone who's listening to this, who's not making a billion dollars a year is getting taxed by life far more than the government is for just the ignorance that you have to not knowing how to do it. And so that's always been the biggest tax I've tried to pay down as fast as possible, which is like every person who makes more than me knows more than me in some way. And I just have to try and figure out what am I ignorant of that they are not ignorant of. And a lot of people will throw stones and be like, well, that guy doesn't have ethics or that guy doesn't have morals. Like I, I interviewed Grant Cardone um, on my channel and I got so many people were like, oh, now I don't trust you. And I'm like, what is wrong with you? I'm like, the man went from zero to a billion in 10 years. I'm like, I was alive 10 years ago and I am not a billionaire. And you were alive 10 years ago, Mr. YouTube uh, commenter. And you are also not a billionaire. I'm like, so what, what, what happened that was different? And sure, the, one of the big pieces is that there's always the compounding effect of time, right? Is that like, you might be on the right path as long as you are making progress. And that's a big one, right? As long as you're making, you might be on the right path to a billion. Cause like Warren Buffett at, 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 at my age, I think was worth, 10 million in those days dollars. I have to figure out what that is in today's dollars. But like, you know, he was worth 10 million at my age. And I'm like, so maybe it is the right path. I don't know. You know what I mean? But also the world's changed. So anyways, not to get too far on a tangent about that, but um, to answer well, do, the do you, do you think question. That, do you think one of the big things is like, to, 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 to just expand on that, like people assume they need to like someone to learn from them. And oh. I've always, I've never understood why someone Ha sets a requirement to personally like someone to gain value or knowledge from them. Oh yeah. I wrote that down because it's a really good tweet. <laughs> you don't need to like someone to learn from them. That's great. Well, I'm glad I could contribute to your Twitter somehow. <laughs> hey man, I love that. It's a great, it's a great statement. But you know, yeah. Naval said something that I thought was really impactful. And it's like, this is something that took me a very, 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 very long time to understand. So before I explain what that, that quote is, most small business owners suck. And that is why they are small business owners, because they are so bad at virtually all aspects of business that that's why they are small, right? Like the thing that separates small business from big business is skill. Right. And, I, you know, market opportunity, et cetera. But like you can even get into like, well, picking an opportunity is a skill. Right. And so we were like, well, that's easy. He's selling B2B. It's like, well, then why don't you sell B2B or whatever? I mean, I don't think it's that easy, but you get the understanding. Right. And so Naval said, you only do sales or good at selling because you don't know how to market. And you only market because you don't know how to build product. And so I, I think there's a tremendous amount of truth to that, which is like, if you build the product good enough and it takes a tremendous amount of effort to build an exceptional product that grows on its own via word of mouth, because of all acquisition channels, only one of them is quadratic in nature, right? Only one of them can multiply and compound on its own. Every other acquisition channel, you get an affiliate, it's a one-to-one -one relationship. You get, you know, you dollar in, dollar out. Same thing with, you know, ads. It's like you put a dollar in, you get a fixed amount out. Maybe it's 10 to one, but it's fixed. So I put another dollar in, I get another $10 out. But for something to be quadratic, it's like I, get, I put 10 in, I get a hundred. 
and then I get a thousand and then I get 10,000, right? And like, and it, and it multiplies. And the only thing that does that is word of mouth, right? And one of the things that's really interesting about the, the internet space specifically is a lot of people will start their business. They'll shoot up because they'll figure out how to get ads to work or whatever, whatever their acquisition channel is. They'll figure out how to do that. And then they'll shoot up in revenue, right? And this is particularly for paid ad people, right? And, you know, within six months or 12 months, all of a sudden they're like, man, my, my CPMs are out of control. My cost of acquisition is way, you know, above KPI. Like, you know, Google's changed, YouTube's changed, Facebook's changed, right? They, you know, they, they throw that out there. And the thing is, is like, it may have gone up by like 10%. It may have gone up by 15%, but your cost of acquisition has quadrupled. And so the thing is, is what is the invisible hand behind the scenes pulling the strings against you? And it's the same people who are like, well, word of mouth doesn't exist. It doesn't work anymore. And that's horseshit. Word of mouth 100% completely exists. It's social media, for God's sake. Of course, of course, word of mouth works. It's just working against you. And so right now, everyone has word of mouth that is about their business. The question is, is it neutral? Is it positive? Or is it negative? And then actively destroying your business the way positive word of mouth can grow your business. And so the guys who have positive word of mouth, they see their cost of acquisition to continue to decline, even if their cost per impression remains the same or even goes up slightly because they have that quadratic compounding that's happened behind the scene. Whereas the other guys are having that, that compounding that's happening behind the scenes, which is like, oh, I saw this ad from you know Johnny so-and-so. I think it looks cool. And then they, they message a friend. They're like, oh, dude, heard that guy's a complete you know, like his, his product shit doesn't respond to you. The team sucks. He just has a bunch of VAs in the Philippines who are, who are like your support and it's, it's terrible. And they're like, oh, wow. And then that person, the person who said the negative thing gets asked a question again about Johnny. Another situation tells people he prevented that sale. No one knows why he prevented that sale, but that sale was prevented. And then the guy he tells it to gets another message like, hey, are you going to do that Johnny thing? And he's like, oh, no, I actually heard from Frank that it's, it's actually a really bad product. And they're like, oh, okay. And that's yeah, enough. Yeah. Like it doesn't take a lot to get people to not buy. Right. Yeah. And so no, it's just like you have this machine yeah. that compounds and the, the easiest way to prove it is like, if your cost of acquisition has gone up three X, but the cost per impression has only gone up 30%, you have another thing that's working against you, which is like, so, how is Jim Monch still here six years later, seven years later? Right. And still growing. Right. It's only there because it has at least neutral or positive word of mouth behind it. Otherwise it wouldn't right. exist. We wouldn't be able to acquire customers. You know, I, I don't know if I ever told you this, I might've told you this, but you a conversation me and you had, I believe it was the first time we met. It was backstage at FHL, right? Yeah. And I had this course that at the time was like the hot Facebook ads course, right? And we're standing back there and um, I'm, I, you know, back then I was this little, you know, pudgy, skinny, fat dude sitting there all with a stupid bunny ear hat on, on my head and stuff. And uh, I could just, I could sense your disapproval like through your, through your pores. Um, and I said to you, I was like, hey man, like how's it going with Facebook ads or whatever? You're like, oh, like, yeah. Um, at the time you were like, yeah, I don't know how to do Facebook ads. I suck at them. You just were like, just, I don't even know. And I'm like, well, what is your ROI? And you're like, I don't know. It's like 20 X. I'm like, wait a minute. What? I'm like, what do you mean 20 X? I'm like, I'm at like five X at, you know, spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. What, like, how are you doing this? You know? And you're like, Oh, like, uh, our cheapest product is 16 grand. So I don't give a shit what our Facebook ads cost. And when you said that my entire world world changed, because at the time we were pushing anywhere from six to a million, 600, a million a month on a, on a thousand dollar product. And when you said that immediately, I realized that, and, and this is something that I see other entrepreneurs just don't get. They believe everything revolves around what button you push in the dashboard. And this is life, right? This is reality in the entrepreneur world is you got to push this button. You got to know how to do this thing with this look. Like, none of that shit matters if you have, if you don't have a good creative and you don't have a good product that you're, you're going to and, and the margins don't make sense. So when you said that, I was like, wait a minute, there are far more important things in this world than these little tech things. And so I fundamentally changed my business model and I made, I went all in on high ticket. And since then we were just able to, we went from spending like, you know, 700,000 to make a million to spending, uh, like, 80,000 to make like 600, that it was just nuts. And 
you just revolving around that. And so I don't know if I ever told you that, but that, that, that one conversation, cause I'm the type of person when I hear something that makes sense to me, I'm like all in, like I'll, I'll burn the walls around me and build something new, you know, um, just to make sure that I, I, I understand at a higher level. And so I read your book last week, uh, Jim Lawn's Secrets, and what I thought was, oh, yeah, of course I did, yeah. Well, what I thought was interesting about it, if you do control H on like a digital copy and you replace Jim with just I product. It. I thought about it. I like really considered just literally relaunching it and just call it like coaching secrets because because <laughs> gyms are coaching businesses. They're brick and mortar. Right. So I think that's why we were able to actually build our licensing business with gym launch so quickly was because like I had already spent five years I didn't know it was a coaching business but like when people come into the gym to work out and lose weight like you're coaching them like it's what it is and I had a staff of like I already knew all this stuff but I didn't know I knew it so anyway so yes that is that book is a hundred percent a playbook on how to build a coaching business I know and I was reading it and I'm like I'm like, nobody's reading this fucking book. <laughs> like, I'm like, I mean, for, for coaching there, the gym people are, but the coaches are like, oh, it's gym, it's gym stuff. I don't need that. And I'm reading it and I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, you know, it was just crazy to me. So, so let me do this. Let me ask you a couple of rapid fire tactical questions. Cause I always like to get some super, super, I mean, I love the high level stuff. It's, it's, it's the most important stuff, but from a tactical perspective, right? You mentioned word of mouth. Tactically, and I'll, I'll just just to kind of like set the stage. I'll give you I'll give you one tactic that I've used for word of mouth. I'd love to know how you engineer word of mouth because I'll give you an example. We used to do webinars when I would do I, I would have like a free Facebook group or some sort of free community. I would do a, a live webinar, and then what I would do is I I, I remember hearing about this thing called um, shrilling or shilling. Uh, it's where you hire people to come into a room and you pay them to buy the product and say, hey, I'm buying the product. It creates crowd psychology or mob mentality and everybody buys. Well, I don't like, and it's illegal. It works so good, it's illegal. Well, I don't like to do anything illegal, go to jail or get in any trouble. So I thought, how can I get that same effect, but do it ethically? So I made this little technique called the ethical shrill. And what I would do is at the webinar, I'd say, hey, listen, you're in the free group right now. That's how you got on this webinar. Once you buy, I want you to go into the free group and post, hey, Dan, I just bought the program. Please add me to the student group. And we'd sell 50 people on the webinar, 50 people in the group would go and post that. And then people who weren't even on the webinar, they would just freak out and start buying the product. They'd be like, what are you buying? Where is it? And they'd send them the order page and we'd do a hundred, we'd double the conversion on the re webinar. And there was a, a huge chunk of people that weren't even on the webinar. And I know that that's a very like specific sort of short term word of mouth sort of hack, but tactically, since you believe that word of mouth is like one of the best things, like if you were to go to a company and say, hey, listen, here's how, here's specifically how you're gonna increase your word of mouth, what would you tell them? So this is a good question. So there's two, there's two kind of components to this. So the first one is like, there is what I would consider a linear way of doing word of mouth, which is kind of what you outlined. And there's a lot of different tactics around that. And when I say linear, it's kind of what I was saying earlier, where you get a one-to-one -one relationship where you say, every time we do this, we get an additional 20% or whatever it is. Right. And so those ones are, you know, like when the sales guy closes, somebody he's like, Hey, do you have any other, you know, gym owner friends or do you have any other, other people who might benefit from the same thing? Like just asking that question, we just get referrals and we can bring it in. Mm. Right. And so like little things like that, people are like, well, obviously, but then no one does it. Right. Like that's, that's the thing is that like, no one does it. <laughs> right. Um, and so in terms of like engineering, uh, the, the customer experience, like for us, uh, the thing that gives you the quadratic returns. And like I was saying earlier, there's a million ways you can do like we call it the hinge method where it's like you, the person that is your customer and then their friend and you a three-way message, we call it the hinge. And then that's right. how you bring them in. If you're in an in-person business, you're like, hey, Sandy, do you have any friends who would like this kind of thing? And if, if they say yes, then you're like, awesome. So how about this? Um, you take their phone from them and then you take a picture of you and her and then you text it to a thread with the three of you. And then that way it comes initiated from the friend with you already being you, the rapport kind of being shown as you in person with this other person. So then they can't ghost you. They can't be rude to you. And then you already have so much more like, you know, no like, and trust just from that little exchange. Right. So like, that's like, there's tons of little tactical weed stuff. That's like that. And, and uh, you know, we could spend probably the next hour just going over little things like that. But the, the big ones are the, the metrics that I was saying earlier, right. It's how can we drive time to value? How can we increase the emotional win 
the, the speed with which someone experienced an emotional win in the product, right? So like one of the companies we have has a really long, like the, the way that their, their business model works is that it takes like 90 days for someone from the day they start to the day they basically make their first dollar doing this thing, right? And a lot of times it's like real estate deals, like something like it might just take a long time before someone you know can, can make money. And so rather than just say like, oh, life sucks, I guess that's just what it is. We think, okay, well, how can we, how can we give someone a win in seven days? Right? How can we how can we get as material of a win as humanly possible? And then how can we string them along with emotional victories in shorter time periods? And then of these emotional victories, which of these are activation points? And so the way that we find out activation points is we look at what are the customers, and this works better when you already have some business that's been going on for a meaningful amount of time. And you say, what are the, my, my favorite customers, right? And so then we say, okay, well, these are the people that I love working with. These are the ones that crushed it for me, et cetera. And we say, okay, what experience did they have that are, and what steps did they go through that other people didn't go through? And so usually we can find a, cue, a few key points that along their life cycle that if we can just then reorient everyone towards those activation points, it's like, hey, like ClickFunnels figured out that if someone makes their URL with the landing page, they're like, they stick five times longer, right? So then all of a sudden they had to, they created that as part of the onboarding. And then they started paying for the domains because they just wanted everyone to do it because they knew they got five times to stick, right? And so it's, what are these... Uh, non-traditional KPIs, we call them metrics that matter, right? MTMs, um, that that we can drive that are activity-based, which is like, okay, if someone, and I like, you know, for for, for, for Gym Launch, for example, it was like, I, I just, I don't talk about the portfolio companies because it's their companies and I don't want to share their stuff. But um, like for Gym Launch, for example, uh, we knew that if, if we could get someone to close a $2,000 sale in their first seven days, and this is people who are used to selling $99 things, it's like we can go get them to close a $2,000 high ticket sale in the first seven days, we, we massively extend the lifetime value of the customer. And then secondarily, if we can get them to collect $20,000 in their first month with us, that like they're in, you know what I mean? Like they're in for a year. You know what I mean? No, no questions asked. We are ROI the entire program in the first month in cash collected. So it's how can we engineer these handful of events and in, 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 a, in a B2C business, it might be like weight loss driven. So it doesn't have to be money, right? It's just like, what is what is the, the closest or a chunk down outcome that we can express to them, prompts them, it would be meaningful to them that they would then, and for like ClickFunnels, if you have your own site and you see your domain, there's like this feeling of ownership, feeling of accomplishment that's associated. That's not about making money, but it's just, what are these micro events? And so you do is you take the best guys, you map their customer journey. And a lot of times you can do that qualitatively too. You interview all your best guys and you say, hey, what was like really meaningful? What were some of the big magical moments you've had when you're working with us? And you get this big list of them and you're like, all right, well, these ones we can't engineer. This one we can totally engineer. And then you start building that into the customer journey to increase the lifetime value. And then that's what ultimately drives the word of mouth. So all of that to go back to like, what is what drives word of mouth? Exceptional product. And if you get exceptional product, how do you build exceptional product? You build experiences that drive the results that people want in a choreographed way. So to, to, to sort of put a different perspective on that for these, these online coaches, you almost, it's almost like you funnel hack yourself. Yes. Yeah. So I, I've always, I've always said, you know, the, the, the only person you should funnel hack is yourself because you know, if, if you got some 80 year old dude, with white hair selling the same product that you sell, they're gonna have a different audience, they're gonna have different objections, they're gonna have a completely different experience, you know, than than you. And I remember you saying in I was a YouTube video or something, you were like, hey, the, the easiest way to increase uh, the amount of customers you get is just hire a spokesman, have them say the same stuff you're saying, and you'll attract new people like you. You're like this big uh, Hulkamania dude, right? And maybe some like, you know, timid soccer dad is just going to automatically not like you because you have muscles and he doesn't and he just gets it in his head right or maybe somebody who I, I, it could be anything right or maybe just somebody, a, an old asian lady you know what i mean like yeah. even just going you know what i mean like more the right. other direction yeah or maybe somebody dated a bodybuilder and he was an, an asshole and they've developed this this idea what it could be dumb stuff but you put somebody else on there they say the same exact thing boom you got a customer and that leads me to my to my next question you a see lot this of, so this yeah. is one of the things that we, um, this presentation I'm building right now. Um, but you can see each of these people are people that uh, are now like faces of the company, which is what w allowed us to sell it and also attract different demographics. It's like, all right, we've got I a see girl. the diversity. Yeah. Exactly. hundred percent. And so it's like, we have to attract 
different You can just people. email me that, that slide deck to uh, Dan. At <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but but let, let me ask you this. A lot of people that, that listen to my stuff and, 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 you know, my just anything, my YouTube, whatever, they're they're either online coaches, course creators, or they have some sort of business that revolves almost entirely around their personal brand, meaning it's them, right? So, so when people buy from them, especially if they buy high ticket, they want them. They want to interact with them. They want to talk to them. If they say something, it's, it's, you know, they need to hear it from them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It, you know, their staff, or this is not good enough. And so for somebody who is inherently the bottleneck of their business, because it's pretty much based on their brand. Like I noticed that when you run ads, it says gym launch, it doesn't say Alex Harmozy, but most of these personal brand based businesses, they run it with their name. What is the biggest piece of advice or the thing that they could do now to start thinking about how they can remove them, still make the same amount of money, still grow their business, but remove themselves as that, that bottleneck. Like if they got hit by a bus, would the company still run type of thing? Yeah, so I mean, it's easier it's easier to transition to customer facing uh, first. Like it's a good intermediary is that instead of marketing your face, you market all your customers results, right? And you can do that from a brand. And so that slowly starts to build the brand. And then people are like, and they associate these successes with the brand and you start building brand equity, right? Um, and so like that's, and then I have a big uh, slant or penchant for database marketing. And so it's something that I, I've never heard anybody else talk about. I still haven't made a training on it because I, it's like, so secret sauce and so fucking good. Um, but I'll, I'll share it with the audience. Um, yeah. The reason most people don't market with data is because A, they don't collect it, right? And they usually don't collect it because it's probably not that good. And so it's usually like fix the, like start collecting it, realize how bad it is. And then now you can start driving to fix it. And then once you get good data back from like, like I can tell you all the, the, the metric and it's, it's in every video, it's in every piece of copy, it's on every landing page. It's like, we on average triple the profit of a brick and mortar business, uh, a brick and mortar gym in 12 months. Mm, that's it. That's I the have average. seen that in your ads. You always go back to that. That's true. Right. Because that's the, mm. that's the logic. And I actually tend to have probably, I, I would say a relatively contrarian view on persuasion. And I think that it's the higher up the ticket amount, the more logic is employed in the purchase. Because like, if you're, you know, I mean, like if you're closing a, a $10 million deal, it's not like, let me tell you this epiphany bridge story of when I was like you and I didn't have a $10 million. You know what I mean? It's just like, it, it's a different buyer. And so the higher the ticket price, the more I think logical reasoning you have to employ to get the yes, because this is my belief. They're there because they want it already emotionally. They, they want the promise, right? And what we're doing is giving them the logical reasons to justify the decision. And so most people, if you make the promise, they just immediately don't believe you. And so then it's, how can I, they want the thing, they just don't believe it. And so it's like, how can I help you believe? And a lot of that for me is giving them logical reasoning around that. And if you've noticed any, in any of the ads that Jim Montrose runs in general, a lot of it is data driven. It's just like, guys, like this is the average, you know, amount of leads that our guys get. This is the amount of sales that they're able to generate. This is the amount of extra cash they're able to add. This is how much we cut their churn. This is how much we, like, this is the data. I'm like, and if you're below these benchmarks, we can help you get to these benchmarks. And if you're above it, awesome. Then you don't need us. You know what I mean? Like, cool. And if you expect that you're going to learn the same amount, just iterating on your one gym, spending your whole life trying to fix it, where we can iterate across a thousand gyms and learn every month so much faster to create the best model, then power to you. You know what I mean? But I don't think that's reasonable. But if you want to believe that, awesome. Right? It just makes these very, very logical conclusions. And the thing is, is that the point I'm, re I'm making here is that when you have data-based or logical arguments, anyone can say them, right? Mm -hmm. Some of the more charismatic, emotional driven, maybe story driven, like if you have an origin story that a lot of people resonate with, et cetera, those will be things that will build the founder's business and the face-based business earlier, right? But if we can transition to customer stories, we can transition to more database marketing, then you level up. And the, the problem that most people experience is that they create unsubstantiated claims, right? And so the first reason that we collect the data is so that we can substantiate our claims and so we can be compliant marketers, right? The thing is, is a lot of people don't like the data that they collect, right? <laughs> because it's, right. it turns out only 20% of their people even log in. You know what I mean? Like stuff like that. Um, but you can still always figure out a way to show, hey, of people who A, logged in, right. showed up to four, four coaching calls or whatever it is, right? Um, and sent the emails that we told them to send, 
this is the this is the average return. So then all of a sudden it's like I didn't say everybody, but I'm saying of the people who did these five things. And here's where it gets cool. When you have the data that you can you can substantiate the marketing, you also use the the activities that generate that outcome that you slice the data with as the guarantee points, right? And that's where your customer experience starts driving towards. So then all of a sudden you have this harmony between high marketing that gets the best outcomes, the client experience that someone go through because they're like, well, shit, I, I mean, if I have to attend four coaching calls, send this email on XYZ to get that guarantee and that outcome, then I'll do it. And then all of a sudden the client outcomes improve even more. And so it becomes this virtuous cycle of, like you said, funnel hacking yourself and saying like, what are the best guys doing? What are the key activities? Great, I can slice the data and show that because I just looked at it. That becomes my front end that's, that's data-driven rather than face-driven. And then the client experience is identical to what I told them it was going to be. So you have this, this parallelism, which is one of the biggest issues that happens in a lot of businesses is they promise this thing and then they're onboarding their product is totally different because they've been changing their hooks, changing their offers, changing their funnel, but then they sell the same product. And so there's this disconnect between what I bought and what I got, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's really, you can improve a business just by like, being consistent. This is what you said. This is what you saw. This is what you get, right? And a lot of times it's one of the easiest ways to increase the value of a business, right? And so it's it's doing that across the board over and over and over again. And it creates a virtuous cycle that improves the company. Awesome. Awesome. That There's a lot that you can unpack from there. And I think that if, if anybody listening is really listening, they can implement things, you know, like as you were saying it, I was thinking, okay, Google forum. And then I had this insane thing. I was like, uh, one of the questions would be like, if there was a magical uh, uh, telepathic fairy that asked you if you did everything we told you to do, and if you lied, you would lose an appendage, would you say that you followed our advice? Yes or no? And then, it, and of the people that said yes, how much money did they make? How much did they increase their business, et cetera, et cetera? You know, so I've, I, I, I know, I, I imagine we don't have too much longer. Um, because uh, we have an we have an hour slotted, I believe, right? Oh, no, so, we have we have uh, we have we have a few more minutes. I have a buffer. We're good. Okay, cool. So one final question: uh, In your dealings, right, whether it be a dinner, meeting somebody at an event, doing business with someone, portfolio company, uh, whatever, right? What is the one characteristic quality or dare I say red flag? that you see in an entrepreneur where you're just like, nope, I'm not gonna even associate with this person. And then on the flip side, what is the one that you go, man, this this is somebody I should know? Part of it's two sides of the same coin, but the second one probably has a little bit more explanation. So, um, I mean, the red flag is always ego. Okay. Always, like it's, it's always ego. That's ego, like, that's for personal life. That's for business, especially more than anything for portfolio companies. It's the number one thing that we look for is, is humility. And there's a variety of reasons, but like ego flows to everything it flows to coachability. It flows to their ability to be, to, to, to learn and change their character traits, to become what is required. Um, like a lot flows from ego. Um, and like a lot of the ability to lead, like being a servant leader comes from humility. And to build a $30 million, $50 million, $100 million company, like you need to have that in my opinion. So I think a lot of like, there's, you know, there's these charismatic leaders that exist, but the, you know, Jim Collins has written a lot about this and like good to great and built to last. And, and a lot of these things he talks about, like that level five leader who puts the customer first, who puts the company first, who doesn't try to take credit um, and who always takes blame and gives, gives away credit to everybody else. And, it's honestly very rare. And that's why the vast majority, you know, right now we accept 0.2% of the, of the companies that apply, you know, to, to become a portfolio company. So it's, it's not, I mean, it's an investment model. It's different. You know what I mean? And for us, it's like, I only need one Facebook. Like I don't need to have a hundred, you know what I mean? Like the, the biggest company we have does 250 a day. So, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't need I'd a love lot to of... ask you what industry, but I know you're not going to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> right. So like, there's, you know what I mean? Like we have some, some companies and they've grown a lot. Right. And even that one, we grew by just simplifying everything and just saying, what are the points of leverage? And I, I'm going to wrap this with something that you said earlier, which is like, you realize the high ticket thing. Um, and then that was a huge, a huge like breakthrough, you know, in, in your career. And I remember the conversation really specifically. So I remember you were saying, that you were, you're selling, you know, all these courses. And, uh, 
at the time, if I recall correctly, I was getting a hundred to one. Um, oh, no, that's right. It was some disgusting, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I, cause I remember, cause I gave a presentation at that one. Um, and I remember the, the, the presentation and, um, and the thing is, is I was like, yeah, man, I was like, that feels like a lot of work. I was like, you got to sell like, I was like, like 500 customers make 500 grand. I was like, I need to sell like, like not, not that <laughs> I need to sell a 10th of that. I need to sell like a 20th of that. I was like, yeah, if I just sold like 40 people, I would make that money. And you're like 40 people. And I was like, yeah. And I just remember that because like, I think that was where it's like a, a perfect example of the audience of like finding points of leverage. It's like, is the leverage in my ability to, to buy an arbitrage media and do all the tech little optimizations? Or is there one domino, right? To, to uh, do the Tim Ferriss illusion, right? Or is there one big leverage point that if I just crank that one, everything else falls into place, right? Like if you, if you can figure out and the, and the reverse way isn't, it, the answer is not raise your prices. I mean, sometimes it is, but that's not, that's the, that is the outcome of the deeper thing, which is figure out a way to provide more value. And so like, if you can find a way to make someone a million dollars, you can charge 250 grand, right? Right. Like the reason we come with the portfolio companies and I have this, this visual that I just made yesterday about it, but like, we, you know, we, we come in and we have, we, you know, we get a minority stake for all the, the interest that we do. But it's also because like, if I create $50 million in net worth for an entrepreneur, is it unreasonable for me to ask for 10? Most people would say no. Right. And it's like, well, how do you sell stuff for $10 million? It's like, well, you make someone 50. That's how you sell for 10. Mm. That's how you sell stuff for 10 million. So you acquire the skills to do the thing. And most people want to sell stuff for 10 million, but they have a hundred thousand dollar skill set. And then what happens is they destroy their reputation. And then the word of mouth monster comes and eat them, eats them alive. Right. And so you asked about what is the thing that's the big red flag, which is ego. Um, what is the thing that, that, you know, we look for it's three things. Um, and they're the values of the company. So it's the same thing that I look for in our personal life, same thing that I look for in employees and same thing we look for in portfolio companies. So Layla and I spent a really long time trying to narrow it down because we believe in three values rather than five or 10 or whatever, because you can triangulate thinking. It's very difficult to, to map five values or 10 values against like a decision. And so the first one is, do we believe this person is unimpeachable character? Would we be proud to associate with this person on and off the field, right? And like being proud, not just like being associated, but would I be proud Would I brag about my association with this person, right? That's unimpeachable character, right? And always. And it's on and off the field, which is hard because some people are like, wait, you don't hire someone because some of their personal decisions? I'm like, yep, 100%. Yeah, yeah. Because humans sense. can't differentiate. It's hard to give advice, you know what I mean, in general, if people think that you, you know, cheated on your wife. Like, people, it's harder for people to do that because even if it's good business advice, psychologically, it's difficult, right? And I, I'm a realist. If I think that people are not going to be persuaded by this person or they're going to have all these chip, chips stacked against them, I'm just... I can just choose to make a different bet. You know what I mean? Like I can just choose to have, to, to vote, to vote on a different jockey, bet on a different, different jockey. Right. That's all it is. So one is unimpeachable character. The second is sincere candor, right? Which is, can this person, and it's not, it's not like, can they not bullshit me? That's not, that's not what sincere candor is. Sincere candor is, can they have the hard conversations, both taking the hard feedback and incorporating it. And that is an element of humility. And then also have the empathy to care about the people on their team and give them feedback when it is required. And a lot of people avoid those conversations, the real conversations. It's easy to just like, you know, just give the, you know, no BS, whatever, like direct stuff, but like being like, Hey, surely uh, you seem like your, your head's not in it lately. And the team thinks that you're slipping and I want to figure out what's going on. Right. Or, you know, we gave you that piece of feedback the other day and I felt resistance and it felt like your ego flared up. Right. Like, ha like you can even see my tone changes because like to have these conversations, it's not easy. Right. And if you're going to build a 30 or 50 or a hundred million dollar company, which is the only thing that we're interested in investing in um, is entrepreneurs who we think can get there. Right. And so that's number two. Number three is competitive greatness, because sometimes you've got you know, an, an amazing human, but they're just like really content. And I want to be honest, there's nothing wrong with that. But, but make it a good company does not, you know what I mean? So like, right, right. like sometimes it takes a little bit of, of teeth, you know what I mean? It takes a little bit of competitive 
drive and desire. And sometimes that comes from fear of failure. Sometimes it comes from insecurities. Sometimes, sometimes, and the ideal way is that it's a pull, not a push. That's the perfect world. But I, I accept somebody who is competitively great. Michael Jordan was 100% push, not pull, right? But he was still the greatest, right? And so like, I, I accept that there are different forms of fuel. And I just want to make sure that whoever we are doing business with has one. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I was going to try to, I was going to try to sneak in one more really lame interview question. Like what's your number one interview hack, but I already know your answer. It's find out if Layla Harmozy has the sister. <laughs> 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 you, you told me this recently, you said, you know, find a, find, basically like find a wife or husband that can be your, your greatest partner and can really help you grow. And I, you know, it's such, it is kind of unorthodox advice or at least uncommon advice, you know? Um, but I, I thought that was because who's the person you spend the most time with, right? It's your, it's your significant other. And if that person is not supportive and, and maybe even pushing you to, to go further then you know, my, my grandfather on my father's side, he was a German physicist and he always used to say constant exposure always leads to some form of contamination. And so if you are around someone all the time that is not supporting you, that's not supportive, that is, you know, against the grain, it is going to affect you no matter how much you try to separate it, no matter how much you try to be independent. And so I really did love that advice because it, it made so much sense, you know? Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll answer a question you didn't ask. So, yeah, yeah. That's all, always my big question. What's the question I should be asking? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so to find this, and I'm actually thinking about this overall too, because uh, I was having a branding conversation yesterday with our creative director. And um, I realized that I think there's a parallel between branding and finding a, a mate. So hear me out though. I'm still working on this. Like, no, I'm, theory. I'm, I'm open to this. But yes. I feel very confident in saying that there are three components that make a good marriage. And obviously, you know, we're five years in and people are like, ah, oh, you're young. I'm like, all right, cool. I'll just wait 20 years. And then people listen, whatever. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> um, and like my only, my only dispelling of that is just that like the average marriage, uh, married person spends two hours a day together. Um, 45 minutes of that is watching television. Uh, 35 minutes of that is eating and 24 minutes of that is doing house chores. And so the remainder of that time, uh, from that is like 20 or 30 minutes and that is it per day. Right. And so compared to the amount of time that Layla and I spend together, I was like, we've already been married 45 years based on the amount of time that we spend together. Oh, dude, that's um, a great point. This is a different, you know, different view, different lens. So I mean, I, I know some people who literally only see each other on the weekends because they both work full time. It's like, well, you spend one day a week together. You know what I mean? Like, that's nothing. Anyway, that's that's not my point. The, but there are three things that I think create uh, great relationships in general. Uh, the first is aligned mission, which is, do we want to go to the same place? Right. And a lot of people don't even talk about this. And it's like, this is the life I want to live. And for me, it was like, I want to do big shit. And where I want to go will be hard and treacherous to get to, right? Are you, are you down for that journey? A lot of people are not, comma, and that's okay. It's just that they just might not be your person. And these requirements that I put here, most people will fail as they should, because you only need one. <laughs> like, I remember when I was, I was in college and I was like, this is all the things I'm looking for. And someone's like, and I was talking to a girl who, who, was, who was pursuing me and they were like, Geez, like, good luck finding that. Uh, and I was like, I only need to find one. Oh, man, that's such an amazing perspective on that. Because that, 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 oh, dude, that that hits home because it, it makes sense. Like you, there's, they say, oh, there's all these fish in the sea, but you have all these standards. Yeah, but you only need, you only need to find it once. That's, that's, that's a great perspective. Yeah, like being hot is a price of admission. That is not, that is not the, that is not the, the, you know what I mean? Like the end all be all. That means like you have a ticket to, to play in the show. You know what I mean? <laughs> so one is aligned mission, right? The second is similar values, right? Or ideally, you know, same values, which is we know where we want to go, but how do we want to get there? It's a big part. Some people want to get to the same place and they want to go, out a very, go about it very differently. They have different values, right? And the reason that's important is because you're going to get stimuli that, that come in your life, you're gonna have things, obstacles. And if you're presented with the same data, ideally you wanna make this come to the same conclusion. You wanna make the same decision. And so the variables that you weigh 
and how you assign weight to those things are going to be your values. And so whenever Layla and I, because we've now been doing this a lot, we made a lot of decisions together, a lot of big decisions. If we ever have a time where we're not like on the same page about something, we don't immediately like fight. It's just like, what data do you have that I'm not working with? Because I'm making this conclusion because we have the same values and we want to get to the same place. I'm making this conclusion based on these things. What are you making your conclusion off of? And then she'll share her. I'm like, ah, I didn't think about that. That's a good one. Or I'll share something and she'll be like, oh, totally didn't think about that. That, yeah, that makes complete sense, right? And then we're like, cool. And then we are able, like we haven't had, we've only had one decision in our entire marriage that we disagreed on and I bulldozed Layla and it was the wrong decision, right? Um, and I was like, I'm, I'm doing it. You know what I mean? And I, I shouldn't have done that. Um, and I, you know, and that's the thing. And so like, we have always come to the point where if we don't agree, we don't do, we don't do whatever it is. Like if was we don't agree- Was that a agree, business decision or a personal one? It was business. It was business, okay. And the third piece, so aligned mission, where we want to go, aligned values, how we want to get there, right? And then the third is, I like to say similar interest or you can say lifestyle. It doesn't really matter what word you use, right? But it's like, what are the interests that we have? Because like, you might like, you want to go to the same place, you want to get there the same way, but it's like, if the day-to-day we don't share interests, it becomes more difficult. Like if I was, if I had somebody who was super driven, had the same values, but then like wasn't into like fitness at all, like didn't like exercise, didn't like eating, you know, eating in a way that made sense, like uh, didn't, didn't like, you know, walking, you know, just like, just like, what are my day-to-day things that I like? Or maybe they just love television. I don't know. Like, it's just, are there things that they have that are interests that I'm like, I have no, or maybe they're really big artists. I'm not an artist. I'm not into art. Maybe they love museums. And I'm like, fuck, that sounds horrible. Right. Cause I don't <laughs> want to spend any time doing that. Right. But that, like, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just like, not my vibe. Right. And so it's like, cause if we can have aligned interest, so like the mission and values is baseline. Right. And if we can have the similar interests, then we're going to spend more time together. And then when we get, both exposed to stimuli, we will both adapt the same way. Whereas when people have different interests, they spend time being exposed to different things, and then they end up adapting to the things that they're exposed to, which sometimes can be in the same direction, but sometimes it cannot be in the same direction. And so you grow apart, right? And so the similarity that I'm seeing this with from a branding perspective is like, what, like, what is a brand, right? I've been trying to break this down. I was like, what is a brand? Because people are like, dude, I love your brand. I'm like, what does that even mean? Right. So I'm like, I think on some level, it's like there are some people who are aligned with me on the mission of what I'm trying to do. And they're like, I think this is dope. I'm down to like go along with you. Right. Go along for the ride. And then they also align with the values of like how I want to get there. Like Gary V and I probably have similar missions, but different values, not in a bad way, but just different. You know what I mean? Like we just do, you know, we just do different things. We're different people. You know what I mean? There's nothing wrong with that. Right. Same thing as like there's another girl who might not be your wife, but she might be someone's wife. Right. It's just, just different, right? And then different interests, right? And so if I think the brand, it's like, this is where I want to go. This is how I want to get there. And then this is like my day-to-day, my calves, my work, my dessert stuff, my, you know what I mean? Like these are the day-to-day interests that I have. And I am a minimalist slash a functional, a functionalist, right? And so, and so if you think through those lenses, I think, um, anyways, that's, that's what I think it helps build relationships. And I also think it might be able to build a brand because I think brands are really just relationships with a mass audience. So same mission, same values, same uh, uh, day-to-day environment, uh, desired ideal environment. Oh, and, and hot. You, you mentioned that. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I'll say this, they should be hot for you rather than of course, hot for of everyone course. else. Because sometimes- Beauty's in the eye of the key holder if you're yeah, on the bikes. hundred percent. Hundred percent. Awesome, man. I, I, I'm going to tell you. You know, I think that if we just clip out the last ten minutes of this interview, you, you no one would ever need to buy a relationship course again. You could just watch what you just said. That was like the best relationship advice I've because it was just so brutally, tactically honest. You know, uh, it just stripped away all the bullshit. You know, so that, that I, I I appreciate that. I definitely learned a lot from that. Alex, man, thank you for coming on and and sharing all this. And, uh, you know, I, I, I try to ask some more tactical questions and, and pull out some, some real nitty gritty stuff. So, um, I, you know, I, I, I appreciate you sharing all that and, and getting into the weeds and not doing what most people do and go on these long story tangents that are irrelevant. You know, I, lo- I love your directness. So thank you so much for coming on. And uh, I think people are really, really, really gonna enjoy uh, this interview. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you to the audience.
Thanks, man.